Hey everybody, John Skiba here, and in this video, I'm going to talk about whether you can keep your car if you're going through the bankruptcy process, and I'm even going to explain how the reaffirmation process works. But if this is your first time here to my YouTube channel, go ahead and click subscribe, check on the little bell, that way you'll be notified each and every week when I provide you with valuable information on how to deal with your serious debt problem. All right, let's talk about Chapter 7 bankruptcy and vehicle loans. This is a question I get all the time from clients in my law practice who are looking to uh, file for bankruptcy because they're dealing with medical bills or credit cards or whatever it is. But at the same time, they want to be able to keep their vehicle. As they always say, that's how I get to work. You know, if I can't, if I don't have a vehicle, I'm not going to be able to pay any of my other bills. And so it's a big concern as far as whether you can go through the bankruptcy process and actually keep your car. So let me tell, give you a couple of considerations, and then I want to talk about the reaffirmation process. If you're in bankruptcy or if you've been doing a lot of research on bankruptcy, you've probably come across something called a reaffirmation agreement or reaffirming your car loan. I want to talk about what that is and why it may or may not be a good idea for your situation. So first, let's talk about Chapter 7 bankruptcy. Chapter 7 is designed to eliminate all of your unsecured debts, credit cards, medical bills, uh, personal loans. Anything that doesn't have collateral attached to it generally goes away with the exception of student loans and taxes. And there are even rare exceptions when those can go away. But the when it comes to secured debt, like a car loan, where there's collateral, where you know there's property attached to it, those are treated somewhat differently. <clears throat> so if you have a car and you have a loan against it, you generally can keep that in a Chapter 7 so long as you continue to make the monthly payments. Now, there's a little asterisk that goes along this with this as well. You can't have more equity in your vehicle than is allowed under your state's exemption laws. Now, I know that probably sounds like, what am I talking about there? <laughs> Here's what it is. In Chapter 7, the positive thing is you're going to get rid of all of your unsecured debts. The trade-off is if you have any non-exempt assets, the court can take them, sell them, and give the money that they receive from selling those assets to your creditors. So, but there are certain exemptions on the federal and on the state level in all states that protect certain, uh, you know, basics of living. Like most people are familiar with the homestead exemption that protects your home. Well, there's exemptions for things like cars and household goods and wedding rings and retirement accounts and all that. But there are certain dollar limits that are attached to those exemptions that you have to be aware of. So for example, in Arizona, the exemption for a vehicle, and this is being recorded in the year 2020, the exemption on a vehicle is you can have up to $6,000 of equity in a vehicle. And if you are disabled and you have a, a plate, your, your license plate indicates uh, that you have, like if you have a handicap sticker or just a, a plate that has a sticker on it, you can actually get up to $12,000 of equity in a vehicle that's protected. Now, what you have to look at then if you have a loan is, let's say that your car is, uh, that it's worth $10,000, that you owe $6,000 on it, and so you have $4,000 of equity. You would be fine in the state of Arizona because we can protect up to $6,000 of equity in that vehicle. However, let's say that your car is worth $20,000, and let's say that you owe $10,000 on it, so you have $10,000 of equity, there may be a problem there if, because in Arizona, for example, I only have a $6,000 exemption to be able to protect that vehicle, so you could end up losing the vehicle. They could take it, pay off the note, give you $6,000 for your exemption, and then give the rest to your creditors. That's something you're going to need to talk to an attorney specifically about in your state who knows your exact exemption limits because that could become an issue. So that's the first thing we need to look at. Um, you also need to be aware if you own your car free and clear, if it's totally paid off, if the value of it is more than the exemption, the exempt exemption limit, um, then they can take it. So using my example, if you own the car free and clear, there's nothing owed on it, and it's worth $5,000, in the state of Arizona, you're going to be fine because our exemption is $6,000. It'll protect all $5,000 in equity. However, if the vehicle is worth $15,000 and you only have your $6,000 exemption, they're going to sell it, give you $6,000 to cover your exemption, and then give the rest of the money to your creditors. Um, it's also important to note in the state of Arizona and in many other states, if you're married, you can double these. So example, again, in Arizona, a married couple, each spouse would have $6,000 uh, in a vehicle of equity that they can protect. So 
The basic rule, though, if you owe money on it and assuming that there's not any uh, value outside the exemption limit, you can keep the vehicle as long as you continue to make the payments. Now, the flip side of that is also true. Let's say that you come in and you have this car payment that's just killing you. You know, I see this all the time now. Car loans are super expensive. I have clients come in, they've got a 72 month loan, they're paying $800 a month on it, and they've decided, I just can't do this anymore. If that's your situation, you can surrender the vehicle through your bankruptcy and then you won't owe any money on it. They can't sue you for the balance. They can't come after you later on. You'll be you'll be good to go. So if you're in a vehicle loan or an RV or a boat or something where you're just like, I, I can't afford this anymore, uh, you can surrender it through the bankruptcy and you won't owe anything on it. Let's talk about reaffirmation agreements. This is probably one of the more confusing areas of the law. It's one, it, This is one of the changes that they made back when they amended the bankruptcy code in 2005. That's actually a really long time ago. <laughs> In my mind, I keep on thinking of the recent changes. It's been 15 years. But uh, in 2005, they introduced this idea of a reaffirmation agreement on a car loan. <clears throat> With a reaffirmation agreement, what it says is if you are going to keep your car and you're going to continue to make the payments on it, that you need to be able to uh, sign off on a reaffirmation agreement. This is essentially a new contract between you and the bank that states that you're going to continue to make those payments on it. Typically how this plays out is the reaffirmation agreement is sent to you or your attorney in your bankruptcy case. They have already filled it out uh, with all the information as far as the balance owed, the interest rate, the monthly payments. You're required to look at it. You're required to sign it. Uh, your attorney may sign it. And then you provide it back to the lender who will then submit it to the court. The, the last step is that the court has to approve it. The court has to review the reaffirmation agreement and determine that it's in your best interest for you to sign off on the reaffirmation agreement. You may be asking yourself, why would it not be in my best interest? I'm willing to pay for this. I feel like I can pay for my vehicle. The reason why is because if you sign a reaffirmation agreement and then let's say the court approves it and then a year from now something happens and you're just not able to continue to make the payments on that vehicle and then you let it go back to the bank, they can then come sue you for the balance. Now, if the court had not approved a reaffirmation agreement, they would not be able to sue you for the balance. So that's kind of an important, an important distinction there is that if you have, if you sign off on a reaffirmation agreement and the court approves it, uh, it's highly likely that if you lose that car down the road, you're going to become liable for it. They'll sue you for the balance that's owed on that. Because of that, I can tell you in the state of Arizona, I don't have any experience in uh, doing reaffirmation agreements in any other state, but I can tell you in the state of Arizona, most of the time the courts will not approve the reaffirmation agreement because they believe that it's not in the, the debtor, the bankruptcy debtor's best interest. The court will say, look, just continue to make the payments on it. Under most state laws, as long as you're making the payments on the vehicle, they can't repossess it. Keep making those payments. Uh, and then if you pay it off, great, you're done. If you have to let it go back, even a year down the road, then they can't sue you for it because that balance was discharged in your bankruptcy case. Now, there are some other consequences to either having the reaffirmation approved or uh, not approved by the court that you need to be aware of. The biggest one that is always stressful to clients is credit reporting. If the bankruptcy court approves your reaffirmation agreement, then your on-time payments will be reported each and every month until you pay that vehicle off. However, if the court does not approve your reaffirmation agreement, then the lender, your bank, they're not required to provide any information, either good or bad, to the credit reporting agencies, and they'll actually show that the amount was discharged, even though you're paying it each and every month. So you're not gonna get the credit bump that you were hoping. In most situations, uh, my personal opinion is it's usually not worth it to sign off on the reaffirmation agreement. The, the credit bump that you get is fairly minimal, and there are other ways to, to build your credit post-bankruptcy, whereas the consequences if you were to have the car repossessed after a bankruptcy filing could be devastating because you went through bankruptcy, now you're getting sued for possibly even a big deficiency balance on a vehicle. So I know that that's really <laughs> the, the reaffirmation agreement I have yet to figure out a way to try to explain it super clearly. I've tried to do it in writing and video for clients, and it still gets really confusing. But hopefully that helps a little bit. General rule, if you want to keep your car, assuming it doesn't have more value than can be protected under the exemption laws in your state, you'll be fine as long as you keep making the payments. 
The alternative as well, if you don't want to keep the vehicle, you can let that thing go. You're not going to own anything on it and you get the fresh start. Hope that helps. Thanks for watching today.